change is the name of the game, and after a few modding sessions, your games will never be the same. Modding games is as easy on Linux as it is on Windows, and many avant-garde ideas were born from mods, and so you can experience all of these and more on the Steam Deck. If you've never played a game on PC, then you may be unfamiliar with the concept of a mod. Mods are basically, for better or worse, modifications to your games that you can apply to yourself. Okay, before I continue on, let me get this out of the way first. Not all mods are cheats. If you're an online cheater, kindly stop watching this video and go reflect. Now if you've played Skyrim or Fallout 4 on a recent console, you've probably noticed the Creation Club. The Creation Club is a taste of what you could be experiencing on PC. There are a couple of restrictions in regards to the content as well as the file size. In general, mods fall under a couple of different categories. Of course, these categories depend on the game you're playing. Let's use Skyrim as our example. There are quite a few categories of changes such as brand new items modified items, modified and new enemies, really 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 funny memes like this Thomas the Tank Engine Dragon mod. There also exist balance changes, combat changes, system changes because honestly Skyrim by itself isn't that fun. There are even mods that add new regions, new side quests, they're basically just DLCs of their own. Anyways, how would mods work on SteamOS? How would mods work on Linux? Well, I'm glad you asked. For the most part, mods work as they would normally on Windows. I think an exception to this would be if you have a specialized binary, like Skyrim Script Extender 64. The installation process for a lot of mods is very similar to how it would be on Windows, except, you know, the default location of where your games are will be different. But mods work. Mod managers may be a bit of a mixed bag due to the fact that most of them are Windows only. However, Lutris has an installer for Vortex Mod Manager, so good luck with that. So that's for manual mods, but what about workshop mods? How do they work? Workshop mods are even easier to set up because there's basically no setup at all. The process is exactly the same as it would be on Windows. You just subscribe to a bunch of mods on Steam, and then they download, and then that's it. Of course, do remember that this varies game by game. Some games don't support mods at all. And this is every Workshop mod that I've subscribed to on Starbound. As you can see here, it works as well on Linux as it does on Windows. Nothing really needs to be changed. But why stop at PC gaming, where you can also mod retro games? If you're a fan of game randomizers such as this Zelda randomizer, or perhaps ROM hacks like Kaiser and Mario, the good news is they work on Linux. I don't know why people think Linux doesn't have emulators, but it does, and oftentimes the same emulators you use on Windows. Honestly, all of this should have been something I mentioned in the emulator video, but I'm gonna go ahead and mention it now. You've played these games before, and you know them like the back of your hand. However, the graphics don't look quite as good as you remember them to be. Maybe you remember these games differently, or perhaps you've grown a lot older now. The good news is that emulators have built-in options to increase your resolution. The PPSSPP PSP emulator has the ability to upscale your resolution 10 times. A bump in resolution doesn't sound like it would do much for the graphics, but you would be mistaken. The bump in graphical quality helps immensely, and this is before any other work is done. Models and textures haven't changed, but the game looks so much cleaner and clearer. And there's even more that can be done if you want further graphical improvements. Most games can run at this high resolution, but you need hardware that can handle it. Some games have replacement models and textures that look better than what was originally possible, and it makes the game look better overall. A recent fad in retro emulation is the 60fps patch. 
And yes, it's exactly what it sounds like. It's a 60 FPS patch for games that didn't run at 60 FPS. It looks way better in motion. Your mileage will vary depending on the game. Some games don't have 60 FPS patches because, simply put, they wouldn't work due to physics issues. For example, Dissidia Duodecim has an issue with screen tearing as well as an issue with EX attacks, rather. Mashing Circle doesn't increase your defense as it should. With HD mods and textures, as well as a 60 FPS patch and increased resolution, this looks like the resolution that Square Enix should make, assuming of course they can fix the EX attack issue. Of course mods for retro games are kind of limited in scope, especially compared to what you can do on PC. It's very rare that you'll have additions rather than replacement mods for these retro games. Unlike, you know, Skyrim or something like that. All in all, delving into ROM hacking and retro game modifications is a great way to make old content feel fresh again, and it's a great way to experience games the way you remember them rather than how they actually were. Is it very game preservationist friendly? Probably not. But there's always the original versions if you want to play them the way they were. Players making modifications to their favorite game keeps the spirit of the game alive. It keeps otherwise forgotten experiences fresh, and it makes new experiences out of those old memories. Some of the most popular games in the world were born from just ideas from players as mods. For example, Dota and the entire MOBA genre was born from a simple idea, a simple Warcraft 3 mod. Same deal with Counter-Strike and every tactical shooter that's been made since. Counter-Strike was a mod of Half-Life. Can you believe that? Without the original mods, there'd be no telling when these avant-garde ideas would be made, and it really shows what players want. And without that Warcraft 3 mod, League of Legends may have never been the industry juggernaut that it is today. Which is real unfortunate, because there are AAA devs trying to get rid of modding, trying to attack modders and suing them. I'm a small YouTuber, so I don't know if anyone is willing to listen to my voice, but hear me out. Triple A devs shouldn't mess with an integral part of PC gaming. Players are willing to give these devs free ideas, and yet these devs are trying to get rid of the outlets for this creativity. If it's an online multiplayer game, I understand, but if it's a single player game where you can basically do whatever and your experience doesn't harm someone else's, there's no need to be so aggressive against mods and modders. Let's look at a good guy for once, Valve. Valve has recognized the appeal of mods time and time again, so much so that Valve hired those original mod developers to become Valve employees. Most of Valve's IPs were originally mods turned into their own games, like Counter-Strike, and Valve loved the modding community so much that they gave both modders, devs, and players an easy way to do mods on Steam games. If a dev integrates Steam Workshop into their games, Players have an easy place to download mods, and modders have an easy place to upload mods. And all of these workshop mods sync between all of your PCs that have the game installed. This includes the Steam Deck. That's right, with the Steam Deck you'll be able to take modding with you on the go. As for mods outside of Steam Workshop, they should just generally work. I think modified binaries should work as well, but there's no guarantee for anything, so your mileage may vary. Mods can turn an otherwise boring game into a fun game, and they can fix very glitchy games. Skyrim is an alright game, but without mods, Skyrim can get very boring and it's very buggy at times. Good thing mods can fix both. 